Episode 121, Regulating Your Nervous System with Leah Davidson. Welcome to Latter Day Life Coaches, the podcast where each episode is a conversation between me, Heather Rackham, and one of my amazing coach colleagues. Each coach here is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints and a highly trained, experienced life coach making a great impact in the lives of their clients. And together, we have one main goal, helping you live your best life no matter what. You ready for this conversation with the coach? Here we go. In self-help work, we often put the majority of our focus on controlling our mind to create different outcomes in our lives. There are so many good things that come from mindset work. But Coach Leah Davidson is here today to talk about the often overlooked importance of regulating the body as well as the mind. As you listen today, Leah will teach you so many good things about the mind-body connection and how to get your body's nervous system in a state of regulation so that your mind can then be in a state to create new things that in turn will create the results you want. Leah believes, and science shows, that if your nervous system is not regulated, the mind will not be able to regulate either. This is a fascinating episode, and if after listening you would like to do more work on regulating your nervous system, please contact Leah and see how you can work with her. And if you have any questions about today's episode, please drop them in the review section of Apple iTunes, and Heather will be sure to answer them in a future episode. Now, please enjoy this content-rich episode with Leah Davidson. Hey, welcome to the podcast today, everybody. I am super excited to be joined by Coach Leah Davidson. Hey, Leah. Hey, how are you? Fantastic. I Like usual, I always, we kind of chit-chat before we push record and I had to finally, okay, stop. We have to actually, <laughs> it's so fun to talk with Leah, but Le- Leah, can you tell us a little bit about you before we continue on? For sure. For sure. So I'm obviously a life coach and my focus is on stress and burnout and resilience. I've also been a speech pathologist for over 24 years now, which is kind of crazy. And when most people hear that, they think of like, oh, how does that relate to life coaching, you know, helping people with their articulation or their R's. But I've worked in the area of cognitive communication, which is working in traumatic brain injury, working with the brain. So neuroplasticity, the nervous system and the executive function skills. And then I became interested in mindset work because I wanted to see if that could sort of up level my help with my clients there. I became certified with the life coach school and then loved working with clients with their mindset, but started to realize that just wasn't enough that things were missing and that it was more about the mind body connection. So the past couple of years, I've done a deeper dive into stress and burnout and compassion fatigue and the mindset connection. And I have been working on that. I'm from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, where I live with my husband. We have a blended family of five kids, only one who's still at home and only half time because he's my stepson. And so our family is slowly expanding at the same time where we live and our household is slowly shrinking. (laughs) So (laughs) it's kind of a weird thing to grapple with a little bit, I think. I don't know. It's fun and it's strange and it's sad all at the same time. It is. It's very, yeah. It's all those things together, which just goes to show you that you can hold so many different emotions all at the same time. Yeah. You know, I, I love that you talked about mindset because I know for me, understanding that was a huge, for lack of a better word, like a slingshot in propelling me into this world that I didn't have any idea could be so helpful for me. But like you learning all of that work, I've also started to see that there were other things that I needed to include in my coaching and for myself as an individual. So I'm so glad we're going to talk about that today. And where do you want to go with this? How do you want to get started with this? I'm like you. I love, love, love mindset stuff. And I think it's super important and the tools that we teach people on that they do have the option to change their thoughts, to choose their thoughts. I think that is life changing tools. And so I'm so glad that I learned that and I shared that. I know that when I was 
working with my clients as a speech pathologist and they have traumatic brain injuries, my role is to help them develop these cognitive communication strategies. And what I started to see was that it was very hard for them to be making changes cognitively because there was so much other stuff going on. And I saw that then when I started coaching with people too, I'm like, okay, well, just change your thoughts. You know, this thought is not serving you. And, and we would ask questions, which I still continue to ask, but I would see that people would get stuck and they'd be making gains and sometimes they'd be going back and forth. And so I learned, okay, there's got to be more to it. Why are we not able to change our thoughts as easily as it should be if our thoughts are all optional? And that's where I stumbled across really all the different layers and dealing with the nervous system. So the nervous system is really the brain, the spinal cord, and all the nerve connections. It's how the mind and the body actually communicate with each other. So once I started understanding, oh, there's a role for the nervous system within all our thought work or before our thought work is really what, what I look at, that's when I started to see my clients were having changes that were lasting changes, changes that made sense for them. They felt them in their body as well as in their brain, and they were able to keep these changes. And it was able to have like a dramatic effect spilling out into, into their life. Mm -hmm. So mindset is super important, but there is another layer. Tell me what that looks like when you start to work with somebody and you're, and you do have to help them see the mindset. Cause that is a very important yeah. piece to see, right? The things that we can own, the things that we have a part of, what does it look like when you start to help them with the, the nervous system, the nervous system? Yeah. So the way I explain is I, you know, I love the neuroscience part. So I always talk, okay, let's understand what the nervous system is. We all have one. We're all like, oh, I know what the nervous system is, but we need to sort of have an owner's guide of how does it work? Yeah. What's going on? So essentially, I just want you to think like your brain is constantly scanning for safety and danger and just safety and danger. And it's looking for these cues now. And also safety is not the absence of danger. So it's actively looking for cues. It's picking up on cues all around you, cues that are going on inside your body, cues that are happening between you and me, like we're searching for it. And it is all based on what the nervous system perceives, not what is actually happening. Now, based on safety or danger, this is the nervous system actually assigns a certain biological state that it's going to go to. Now, this is really important because this is where there's a difference between mindset and nervous system stuff. Mindset, we talk about how, so based on, say, your circumstances, you get to choose what you make them mean. And when I work with clients, I'm actually, that is true. But between your circumstance and your thought, there is a space. And that space is the biological reaction. So your nervous system confronts circumstances, safety and danger. It is not a choice. It gets assigned a state of connection or protection. So it's not a cognitive. This is biology. Your biology is responding. And at this point, you're not thinking. You are not choosing. It's not under our conscious control. And it does it, it picks up on these cues. It's something called a neuroception, which is a coined term by Dr. Stephen Porges, who is one of the founders of a neuroscience theory called the polyvagal theory. And so your nervous system is picking up on these cues and it's going to send it to a place of connection or a place of protection. So a place of connection is what I'll call the zone of resilience. And this is what we can also call a safe place, a home place. In the polyvagal theory, they call it the safe and social zone or the ventral vagal zone. And this is where you feel good, you feel connected. This is where you can have curiosity and compassion and confidence. This is where we can process emotions in a healthy way. This is where we're much more in tune to the spirit. This is where we'll, we'll have our ups and downs, but generally speaking, it's a safe place. And according to the nervous system, this is what we'll call the parasympathetic system. This is a place of rest and digest. And like I said, this polyvagal theory, it calls it ventral vagal state. The reason it's called ventral vagal is there's something called the vagus nerve that you have in your body. You've probably heard of it. There's a lot of talk about it now. This vagus nerve is basically a collection of nerve fibers that is a feedback loop between the brain and the body. And if 
we neurocept, if we pick up on danger, just biologically, it's going to send us to one of two places of protection. The first place it's going to put us into is what we call the sympathetic state. And this is where we get activated. We get ready to mobilize. This is where you're going to find fight, flight, freeze. So we've probably all heard of that. So your body senses danger. It's going to go first into sympathetic, fight, flight, freeze. It's going to do whatever it has to do. And I call this team hyper because it's like it's hyper aroused state. You're going to be reacting very quickly. You're trying to protect yourself. Now, if your body feels like it can't protect itself, it needs to start conserving energy. It's like the fight or flight's not working. We got to conserve energy. It moves you down into another state, which is called the hypo aroused state, which according to the polyvagal theory is also a different branch of parasympathetic. So according to that theory, we have sympathetic where we get aroused. We have parasympathetic where we drop down and we go into shutdown and conservation. Why it's so important to understand your state. So as I've said, hopefully it hasn't been too confusing. You have these three states. You need to know what state you're in because it is that state that is going to sort of drive what your thoughts, your feelings and your actions are. And when you are in an aroused, dysregulated state, so either on team hyper or team hypo, you actually lose access to a lot of your thinking skills and your language skills. So that's why people will be in a state and they'll be like, I just can't think straight, like either because they're so jacked up or I'm so collapsed and shut down. I just I can't even think. I don't even want to think. I don't even want to have anything. So when we're in those zones, we don't have access to that prefrontal cortex where all our thinking comes. So when we say to people, let's work on your thoughts, you can only really work on your thoughts when you are in that zone of safety and that zone of regulation. And that is why it's so important for us to understand the nervous system, because that nervous system is really fueling all our thoughts, all our feelings, and all our actions. Oh, that is so fascinating. And I feel like there's so many layers there that we could (laughs) peel back and like do a deep dive into. I guess I don't even know where to go. I'm like, oh, where do we go now? Because there's so much, but I think it's so amazing. Um, I, but my thought here is that the skill that we teach oftentimes is awareness, like helping people to be aware of not just their cognitive Mm -hmm. state, but their physical state. And I think if that would play a huge part here, it's huge. Yeah. Yes. And that's the first thing, like, You know, we want to know in awareness, first of all, it is completely normal that we go through up and down in these states. It's completely like there's not one state that we're not going to as humans encounter. What happens though, a flexible nervous system needs to have a very wide zone of safety and it needs to be able to move in and out of these systems with a lot of flexibility and be very adaptable. When we talk about people having challenges or people being stuck in trauma, essentially what that is, is they're stuck in a dysregulated state. So people who are experiencing trauma, they're either stuck in hyper or hypo or they're waffling between the two. So we want to build up awareness because we want to get to know, like, what is our individual nervous system like? We all have a different nervous system. Our nervous system is shaped like from the moment we are in utero, we pick up on cues from our mother. We throughout our whole upbringing, our nervous system is being shaped. And the beauty of neuroplasticity is we're continuing to shape our nervous system to this day. But you and I are going to have a very different nervous system, depending on what experiences we've had in our life, as well as like our personality characteristics. You know, when people have certain tendencies towards maybe being people pleaser or or perfectionistic tendencies, those are nervous system states. Those are nervous system adaptations. So the first thing I do with my clients is let's get to know what your nervous system is. If you have been somebody who has experienced trauma or a lot of chronic stress 
or even just on a daily basis, you've got a lot going on, your safety zone or your zone of resilience may be very, very small. And you'll feel that by you're going to be able to be quote unquote triggered very easily because something will go wrong and there's no bandwidth for you. You just can't take it anymore. Like the straw that broke the camel's back. I just can't do it. And you'll flip into dysregulation. Whereas for some people, they have a larger zone that for, you know, they've worked at it or they've had different life experiences. You can grow your zone. So maybe they're very aware. So the first exercise I do with my clients is help them understand what their landscape looks like in all three areas. So when I feel safe, when I'm in that zone of resilience, when I've got it going on and I feel connected, what is it that I feel in my body? What is it that I do? Who are the people I like to hang out with? What music do I like to listen to? What exercise do I like to do? And then even what thoughts do I have? What feelings do I have? What actions do I take? So within that zone, you may say something like, you know, I feel alive, I feel compassionate, I'm curious, I'm confident, I love to hang out with, you know, like certain number of friends, I have a great morning routine, I put on songs that pump me up. These are all the things that make me feel safe. And so we create like a personalized menu. This is my safety menu. And then, okay, what does it look like when you get hyper aroused? And I usually say to people, what are the indicators to you that you're starting to get hyper aroused? And, and for one, for me is like, I start to get a little less patient. I start to get a little sarcastic and I start to get a little bit more irritable. That's an indicator to me. I'm leaving my zone and I'm heading into that team hyper. And when I'm in team hyper, if I'm on the slant of being in fight, spirit, I may be like pretty aggressive and pretty defensive and pretty snappy with people. If I'm on that team flight, then I may be something like over worrying, overthinking, over analyzing, chronically busy doing things. And that indicates to me, these are the signs that I am in this hyper zone. I want to know these things because these things are going to, if somebody says to me, you know, what are you thinking right now? Well, if I'm constantly overthinking and over talking and over analyzing, I can probably guess that I am in a more hyper aroused state. And then we do the same thing for hypo. What is it that you're feeling down there? Well, chances are more hopeless and helpless and sad and lonely. And I'm probably going to be much slower in my movements. My posture is going to be more shrunk. I feel like I'm invisible. I don't want to do things. So you start creating awareness so that when you're hit with a situation of life, the first story you want to look at is what is my body telling me? What is my autonomic story? And then when you see that, okay, I see I'm sort of hyper aroused now. That makes sense because I'm thinking and then you're able to see the kind of thoughts that match that zone. So being aware of your landscape is truly, truly one of the best things you can do because it also removes this idea like this is you, like this is your nervous system. This is your biology responding. Like there's no, there's no shame or blame or anything like that. This is just, oh, this is how my body responds. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I couldn't help but think while you were describing all of that, the compassion that that offers you when you are observing those two different states in yourself, right? Rather than thinking, I shouldn't be behaving this way. Something's yeah. gone wrong. It, it just, that awareness of just like, oh, this is how I, this yeah. is just this, my nervous state, system. this is just yeah. my nervous system. Yeah. It opens up so much more opportunities for us to learn and grow because we're not just right. beating up on right. ourselves for, for yeah. experiencing that. And to get that compassion, you have to be in a safe zone. Yeah. And to get curious, you have to be in a safe zone, which is why we want to first always work with what we have in our body. Like, so that if you feel like, oh, I've got a lot of, you know, my heart's pumping, my, my breath is shallow, 
I want to try to work at calming myself down so that I can access my compassion skills, so I can access a lot of those things, but there's no shame in it. You're sort of meeting your body where it is. Oh, okay, this is what's happening. Yeah. I'm feeling like really, really lethargic today. I'm feeling really low today. My body's sending me this message. I don't have to judge it. I just understand, oh, okay, this is what's happening with my body. And then if you deal with your physiology, the psychology will follow. Yeah. And we're trying to do it the other way around. In many cases, we're trying to deal with the psychology and force the physiology. And it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason, which is so fascinating, when I learned this, it was like a light bulb moment. This vagus nerve that runs through our body, that courses through our body, it's called the wandering vagus for wandering nerve. It starts in the brainstem. It continues, it wanders, it has branches to sort of the face and the heart area and branches down to the organs and into the pelvic region. You can think of it like it's a massive super highway of connections. 20% of the fibers go from the top down. So from the brain to the body, sending messages. So they're, they're motor, sending motor messages. 80% come from the body to the brain. So if we were to think of it like five super highways, there's one super highway going down, there's four super highways coming back up. And yet when we do the top down approach of working with cognition and mindset, which is so important, we do want to work on that. We're actually only tapping into 20%. The other 80% still is like, okay, what are we going to do? And if we start accessing things from the bottom up first, then we're taking advantage of this vagus nerve and, and the role that the vagus nerve has to communicate what's going on in the body to the brain. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I can't help but think also that when you said we, we can't have that compassion, we can't make change from a place other than a zone of safety, yeah. that even just and tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think even just acknowledging that, oh, I'm in a hyper state or I'm in a hypo state starts to put you one step closer to a zone of safety. Exactly. Exactly. Because you're allowing yourself to be where you're at. You are mm -hmm. like, there's no judgment for it. And there's an understanding, I guess there's a, in, a built in sort of understanding and compassion for yourself of, oh, of course I'm in this zone. Like this is sort of what my wiring was. This is what my experience has been. These are the, the traumas that I've experienced. Mm -hmm. And I think it also offers for other people that when you're, we are looking at other people and what they're experiencing, you can have an understanding, oh, this is your nervous system responding. I had just one of my kids call me the other day in a state of panic. And years ago, I think that panic would have brought my panic up. And then I would have been approaching it panic with panic. And instead, right away, I was like, okay, this is his nervous system talking. The best thing that I can do is something called co-regulation, which is where if I'm regulated myself, I can be that safe space for him and he can feed off my regulation. I can model it for him, which in turn is going to help him come down. Mm -hmm. So instead of me cognitively trying to talk him out of it, I was just able to sit and listen, tell me what's going on. Tell me what you feel. Where is that? Let's take a breath. I was able to help him regulate. And then when he was ready, we were able to, okay, let's talk mindset. Like I didn't say let's talk mindset to right. him, but essentially right. that's what I was doing with him, right? Like right. allowing him. And it just makes your relationships so much more peaceful when you're able to look and say, oh, this is just their nervous system. This is just what, what's going on for them. I wonder what happened to them in their life that they feel that this is threatening to them. Mm -hmm. Because we're, we all like, don't forget this hyper and hypo, they're zones of protection. So they're survival zones. Our, our, our nervous system is doing it because it senses that we're in danger. So it puts us into these zones to protect ourselves. And so we can have the compassion and just say, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what, what's going on for that person, why they're feeling threatened. And then as a coach, you know, from this perspective of, what can I do to help co-regulate? And that's why the most important thing you can do is be regulated yourself. Which seems like it takes a full circle back to one of the things you said in the very beginning was we either go into a state of protection or a state of connection. And it, it, maybe the word wasn't state, but that, those yeah, were the two yeah, words that state. I heard was yeah, protection yeah. and connection. And 
our connection with ourself, if we can have that, if we can help ourselves be in that safety zone, yeah. connection with other people is, can't exactly. help but be affected. Exactly. Yeah. And, and when I, I'm totally simplifying this, although it is not, it's not much more complicated, but we have these three zones. There is also what we'll call mixed states. And that is where there's a zone of safety with some sympathetic energy mixed in and we'll mm -hmm. call that like the play zone that is sort of where you want to be when you are you know giving a presentation that's where you and i probably are right now mm -hmm. i'm feeling safe and grounded but there's some excitement there's maybe some nervous energy there's maybe a bit of anxiety that can fuel me to do a good job to be able to be on to be talking. Mm -hmm. And that's where like people in sports have to be, they they need to have I feel safe and grounded, but I'm also ready to go out there and to play the game. Mm -hmm. And then there's the safety zone that gets mixed in with a little bit of that lower energy. And that's where we're going to have a lot of stillness. This is where we're probably going to have like, you know, some pondering, some meditation. So safety is like the basis. And then it's like we mix in the recipe. Let's add a little bit of energy and we'll get play. Let's add a little bit of energy and we'll get stillness. So from that zone of safety, we can go up and down in safe ways or we can sort of lose control and then we end up in hyper or end up in hypo. Yeah, all of us really just want to have more control in our life. And we try to control the things outside of us. But yeah. this to me is just one more way that we can have some sort of, we are going to view it as control, like we're able to control yeah. ourselves, which will, but it's just more education, right? That yeah. helps us, it kind of gives us some more equations to add to well, it's more of an acceptance of what our biology is. Yeah, it's an acceptance because there really is no control. There's no choice in the right. matter. Like we, it's not a conscious thing. The second we try to control something, we end up going into that zone of hyper. Like, right. how can I, how can I manipulate things? How can I change things? So I think just understanding there's some, there was definitely some relief to me when I realized like, oh, this is biology. Like, this is just the way, and my brain and nervous system are always going to react like this. I'm never going to be able to stop sensing safety and danger. But what will happen is it's like I'm sharpening my scanner so that instead of like everything being danger, I'm able to have a little bit better ability to scan, all right, this is danger, and then follow some procedure, so to speak, or a follow a path that I can really evaluate. Is this danger? Is this response necessary? Do I need to do this? So once we acknowledge the biology, then we're able to say, okay, the biology is there. Now, what can I do to bring it back under my conscious control and now start thinking about it cognitively? Mm -hmm. What can I do in my body? What can I do cognitively? And then change the pathway. But initially, it's, it's based on your nervous system and your yeah. nervous system is based on, you know, so many different right. things throughout your whole life. And I guess that's the control piece that I was thinking of is the control yeah. that we have is our ability to be aware, to watch yeah. our state, to watch yeah. ourself move in and out of those stages. Exactly. And it's not the control per se that we think yeah. that we want, but it's actually what we actually need. Anyway, yeah. so it's so interesting to learn all these moving parts. Okay, so as we get ready to wrap up here, if somebody listening today is like, yeah, this is exactly why I think I'm stuck. Like I haven't been able to make the progress that I wanted to make. What are some tips? What are, I mean, we've talked a lot about it, but like what's like some simple little things that you would tell them to start with? Yeah. The first thing definitely, I think, is just start to to map out where do I feel safe? Where what are, what's happening to me when I get into that hyper state? What happens to me when I get in that hypo state? Then most people, when I start coaching them right away, they're like, "Okay, I feel like I'm in hyper. How do I get to the you know the main zone? <laughs> yes. Like, how do I fix this?" And um, I usually say. If you have spent a lot of time in either hyper and hypo, which a lot of us have, and so there's no judgment there. This is just the way we things that have happened in our life. We have to remember that the zone of safety may not feel so safe to us because it's not familiar to us. 
So one of the best things that you can do is work on creating a wider, a broader, a zone of more capacity to hold safety. So I usually say to people, you really have to work on how do you feel safe? What are the things that allow you to feel safe? And we start with some of the basics, sleep, movement, nutrition, hydration, getting proper sunlight. Those are sort of like the fundamentals that you want to do. And then we move to, I, I talk about in um, my program with people, I talk about there's like, think of it like you're, you're joining a sport team and you've got practice, and then there's game day. During practice, you are going to have to do things like build up your endurance, work on your drill skills, plus work on sort of set plays that you'll do during game day. So the practice techniques will be things like, are you completing your stress cycle on a daily basis? Are you doing things to allow the stress to move through your body, which will be things like walking, exercise, exercise, dancing, stretching, yoga, then it's going to be looking at things like meditation or meditative activities. We have things like um, working on creative expression. These are all things that as you do them, they help create a zone of safety for yourself. And you're sending a message to your body that you're safe because you're able to invest time in these things. And then things like connecting with people, um, laughter, affection, all the things that help reduce your stress level and complete your stress cycle are things that are also going to grow your zone of resilience. Then you can do things that will sort of tax your nervous system in a safe and healthy way. And that's where things like cold exposure come in, where, you know, there's a lot of talk about taking ice baths and things like that. I'm not quite there yet. Yeah, no, I'm, that's like a hard no for me. <laughs> but doing things like taking a cold shower or turning your shower down to cold at the end of the, the of your hot shower. The reason that works is it, it sort of throws your nervous system into a response and then you're forced to deal with it in a very safe, contained environment. So you're building up your tolerance to withstand the stress. And that's why we do things like cold exposure, some types of breath work. If you've ever done, I do with my clients, like a very activated breath work that can build up this, the zone or even things like doing something that's hard for you, where you're sort of pushing, trying to push yourself to do hard so that you can learn that you can do hard. So the first place for people is you have to be growing that zone of resilience so that when you are in hyper or hypo and you want to go somewhere, you have a home to come back to. You're like, oh, yes, this is where I am. You can't be on vacation and being like, I'm desperate to go home. Well, where's home? Well, I don't have home. Or the home that I have like burned down a little while ago and it's a tiny little hut. Like we need to build up that home. And that is by doing all the things that will help create safety in our lives. That was a really good visual for me. Just recognizing that that's what we're trying to do is to create this space yeah. and, and we have to practice that it's a learned we have to practice that yeah. Yeah. yeah it's not you know we talk we we talk a lot about neuroplasticity neuroplasticity is so amazing and it's so incredible but it's not a passive thing we cannot just be um thinking we're exposed to something and then our brain is going to change pathways it doesn't work like that it has to be actively engaged we have to actively engage in doing something to change the pathways it's totally doable but it does require it does require that mm -hmm. effort and the time and the consistency and the love and the acceptance and the compassion and because these things are, it's hard. It's hard for us. It's scary for us to be doing things. Even if we're trying to create safety, for some of us, safety is not a familiar place. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to be creating that. And that's why there's all sorts of techniques that we talk about. Like you don't want to do it too quickly because you could end up, you know, hurting yourself. You also um, can be really helpful if you have somebody along with you, like to co-regulate. Like I give um, one of my clients, a couple of my clients who are really in sort of that hypo state, I say to them, it's almost like 
you want to envision somebody who's co-regulated in a very safe place, reaching a hand down to help you stand up and mm -hmm. not stand up and come join me over here, but just like, I'm going to help you stand up today. So it's a slow process. It's doable, but it requires the awareness and it requires time. Like we have to be patient, patient with ourselves mm -hmm. as we develop these new skills and this new language. It's a new language that we're actually learning. Yeah. Because we're on a Latter day Saint, you know, yeah. podcast here. I can't help but think when you said it's helpful to have somebody who is in a co regulated state to imagine somebody helping you there. I, my first thought was that picture that we've seen frequently of the Savior oh. reaching down into the water. Yeah, it's like, in my kitchen. Yeah. That is that's why that's one of the reasons why we need him that's one of the reasons why we exactly. need that knowledge is we may not always have somebody who yeah. we perceive as being in a regulated state and he always is. always is he is the perfect example of being regulated yeah. and you think of like all the feelings and thoughts that that you can get when you're in that zone of resilience are all his attributes you know, kindness, compassion, curiosity, tolerance, patience, all the things that we want to grow are basically like we want to be more like the Savior. And the Savior is in, he's like the best example of being in that zone. And that's where also when we are in that zone, we are so much more able to feel the spirit and recognize and respond to the promptings because we're just in tune with it. We're just yeah. open to it. We don't have all the chaos of the two other, two other zones. Oh, so good. And, and a great way to end, I think. Leah, thank you so much. Can you tell people where they can find more of you? Absolutely. So I am at Leah Davidson Life Coaching on Instagram and Facebook. And my website is Leah Davidson Life Coaching as well. And I also, I created a short video series and PDF that people can download. Um, I think the link will be in the show notes. And it's called the 30 Second Solution to Burnout. And in it, I do teach some of the things about the nervous system, how stress impacts us. And then I teach a couple of tools that are fundamental for when I was talking about the training and the game day, I mm -hmm. teach some of those tools. So it's, it's simple for you to start understanding why the nervous system is so important and what to do. And this video series can get you started on helping you build up your nervous system so that you can grow that zone of resilience. Oh, I, can't wait to watch it. So thank you for sharing that and making that available to our so listeners. Welcome. I appreciate it. And everybody that's listening today, thank you so much for being here. I hope this has been educational. It has surely been educational for me and just one more layer of things that I want to continue to learn about. So thank you, Leah, for awesome. helping us learn and grow today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Have a good one, everybody. Hey, we just wanted to thank you for spending part of your day here with us at Latter-day Life Coaches and being part of this conversation. Share this with your friends so that you can have a conversation with them on this topic as well. And as always, subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Have a good one, my friends.